<laughs> yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to IoT Liverpool and Livelog. Uh, this uh, joint meetup we've got. Uh, so I'm Adrian McEwen from IoT Liverpool. Uh, Dan is manning the computer and waving in front of the camera because he doesn't care about any of the rest of us. Um, just the stream <laughs> uh, from Livelog. Or should I get Neil? We should have got Neil up instead. Yeah, we would have all been fine. Um, anyway, um, uh, not that you need to listen to me prattling on about anything anymore. Um, some minor bits of housekeeping. Welcome to Does Liverpool, if you haven't been to Does Liverpool before. Um, this is the event space. Uh, we've got kind of a maker space and co-working space and stuff through the other side. Um, if you want to have a tour around to see what the stuff's like, you know, the 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC machines, all soldering irons, all sorts of stuff, um, then, then give me a shout um, after the talk or ask Jackie as well, um, who's one of the other um, directors here at Does Liverpool. Um, we'd be happy to show you around. Um, we're not expecting any fire alarms, so if one goes off, it will be presumably for real. Um, fire escapes are out the way you came in. Or alternatively, there's another route across, so like round the corner and through the double doors, and across to the far far side of that, there's another fire escape out there. Um, toilets, uh, the easiest ones to get to are on the basically the bottom of the stairs. So if you go to the bottom of the stairs and just kind of round the corners there, there's um, toilets. Uh, yeah, hopefully you've been helping yourself to beer and pizza and soft drinks or cider or what have you. Um, and this evening, we have a foreigner <laughs> who's trekked across the border all the way from, uh, from North Wales. Um, although he's been here uh, many times for Makefest and things, stuff like that. Um, so Carwin is, is doing a you know, great job of building the tech community in North Wales and is always interested in trying to kind of join things up um, and drag people from you know, this side of the border across to see what sort of stuff they're up to and get more people kind of collaborating, talking to each other, um, which is always interesting. I and mean, we've been like trading ideas about how to do that sort of stuff for oh, wow. years to, to varying it, levels it of success. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, and I suppose a month or two back, was yeah. it, when was it? Was it like was it start of last month or something? of April. Okay, there you go. End of April, uh, John and I went over to Anglesey <coughs> and caught up with uh, Carwin and with an initiative that they're launching about um, IoT stuff over in North Wales at the minute. Um, and we were like, you should totally come and you know, tell, tell the people in Liverpool what it is and try and persuade some of us to you know, get involved, do some stuff like that, um, and just find out more about what's, what's happening on sort of just down the road. So um, without further ado, uh, I give you Carwin. Thank you. Oh, bright lights. So, I'll give you a idea of what we're up to over there. Um, we've got a, a meetup group. If you go to meetup, you'll find us. You might have seen us already. Uh, it's a community of volunteers, just like IoT Liverpool or uh, the Lug, and um, we get people together. Um, literally, all of North Wales. That's something different to most meetups. They're usually kind of in the city or in, a, in a, an area. We've largely managed to get across um, most of North Wales, and you know this is this is the pitch. You know, people want to do the tech in this kind of location. I'm going to skip through some of this. This is the kind of usual spiel of what we are, but we've got about 700 members, which is about similar to IoT Liverpool actually, but we're stretched out across all of North Wales. And this is what we're about. So this is kind of shouting about what we're up to over there. But I want to show you a couple of other slides now. So we, we you know we do meetup events. We've done some hands-on practical stuff. We've got some, we've been lucky enough to get some fairly um, high profile speakers to come along. Uh, Jake used to work for Google and came us over to, talk, to, to, to tell us about how to build Android. Lots of other interactions. I just want to give you a feel for you know, lots of different programming languages, hands on activities, tech talks like, like this one. This one's interesting. This is um, Porth Mad Dog, which is quite rural, pretty, you know, a town of a few thousand people. And we still managed to fill the room in the middle of. You know, rural, rural North Wales. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, let me show you. Came to Make Fest last year. This is us over here. Had a fair number of people come over, and we're going to come over again this year. Smaller presence. We're going to show you some of the kind of stuff we're up to over there as well. But here's here's where it gets a bit more interesting, a bit different. Um, we've got a lot of agriculture over where we are. Um, 
this is kind of one of the examples of the kinds of things we want to IoT app. This is a, a small, small, um, small holding farm not far from where I live. A couple of acres, lots of polytunnels, veg box scheme, and they're chomping at the bits, wanting to wire up their polytunnels with all the sensors you can imagine. And um, top picture there, that's a lecture from Aberystwyth University that came up, <coughs> teaching a room full of farmers or, agri or, or horticulturists how to program Arduinos to um, build soil sensors. You know, the really kind of cross-discipline type stuff going on here. That picture at the bottom, to give you an idea, there was as many people as that outside waiting to get fed. It's about 80 people over two days came to a farm hack. And uh, I need to give a shout out to this guy, because he was here uh, last year at Makefest. This is the Weedinator. You might have remembered this one. Um, this is um, Paddy, who's building an autonomous tractor. You know, th this is the kind of stuff that's going on over there. Um, I don't want to, uh, this is another one that kind of fits into the IoT space. Um, Joe, who many of you know, came across um, and uh, he's done quite a lot over here actually, but he, he's done a few sessions for us on um, amateur rocketry, uh, CubeSats, that kind of thing. But one of the ones he did was about the Satnox um, ground stations. And off the back of that, we had a bit of a software-defined radio night. And in this case, we were transmitting the North Wales Tech logo from one side of the room to the other. So, we're, so there's, there's communities of people all across the UK. There's quite a few of them in North Wales interested in amateur radio. And you'll see where the connection is in a minute. I'll, I'll switch that from that. If you want to know more about what we're up to there, I've got more pictures there. But that's not why I'm here today. Give you some context. So why I'm here today is to talk to you not so much about the tech, but we can get into that. Um, a little bit. So we're talking about the year of IoT, hashtag year of IoT. Um, what does that mean? Well, this is my trip across from North Wales an hour ago. These are things I spotted or encountered on my train journey. And if there's one thing that the year of IoT has got into my head is to look at, look at everything you see and see how you can wire it up. And I can point to Adrian here because he's good at doing this as well. <laughs> um, so, you know, how many of those things have you already wired up? Any hands up? Has anybody wired up any of these into some kind of IoT type scenario? Some, any of these yet? Any use cases? The old person. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, can, I think now that I've been brainwashed into thinking like this because we set up the year of IoT, most of these I can think of a use case for. Whether it's worthwhile or not is a different question. But we'll come to. I'll come back to this slide at the end. But there's some real examples of this. So, 25th of April, Adrian and John go over, we launched the year of IoT. Um, we're sponsored by a local uh, social enterprise called Mentermon. They, among other things, deliver the leader funding in two counties in North Wales. So, Anglesey and Gwynedd, they deliver the leader funding. Leader funding is for uh, rural development, European funds. Quite a lot of it. I think that's six million over six years, and you know, done a lot of projects. Um, and then over here, we also have uh, Digital Gwynedd, which is a sort of a initiative looking at digital literacy, digital skills, and we have M Spark, which is the uh, science park, um, the university setup. We collaborated with these on this initiative. So I want to give you some. It was on the 25th of April because it was Marconi's birthday. Now Marconi uh, was a pioneer in the radio industry. And um, at our launch event, we had a, a Simon uh, Taylor come along and tell us about some of the history of this. I'll give you the short version. Um, basically, um, <clears throat> a lot of the pioneering long distance radio work was done by this gentleman and his, and his colleagues, including things like the first trans transatlantic um, transmissions, single transmission, so long distance transmission, uh, and the other one was from uh, the UK all the way down to Australia, so from literally one side of the world to the other, uh, back in, ooh, I think, I can't remember the date, 18 something, uh, I'll dig out the date later. But basically, it was the first transmission of that kind. Funnily enough, it happened in North Wales. So it went from North Wales to New South Wales on September 22nd. Um, ooh, I can't remember the date, but... You can see there's a connection. There's amateur radio in the area. There's a strong connection to some of the pioneering long-distance radio. So when I had some discussions with some of the social enterprise people, local authorities, and told them, you know, 
we've got a history in this space. We should be doing more to going back to that picture of a big you know, megaphone shouting about it. <coughs> Funnily enough, it was also World Penguin Day. So this is the only slide I have that connects to the Linux connection. Right? <laughs> well, a bit more on that later. So it, uh, Marconi Day itself, the, the day that's celebrated by uh, radio enthusiasts around the world, is actually not his birthday. It's the Saturday closest to his birthday. Um, and the year of IoT was conceived to run a session, a, a series of events from one Marconi Day, April to, oh, one one Marconi's birthday, April 25th, all the way through to next year. So an entire year of workshops looking at, looking at use cases, I'll go more into that in a second, to do with IoT, connecting it to the, the history that we've got in the area of long distance radio. It seemed like a tenuous, but it goes down well when you're trying to sell the ideas. So the year before, last year, Mentor Mon, the sponsor, had already dabbled in this space. Um, they set up a digital playground in a local agricultural college where they uh, worked with some, uh, the setting up a things network gateway and deployed a series of IoT sensors ac across the farm. The idea being to promote the use of these kind of technologies in the agriculture sector and try and get the youngsters in the college to get involved. It was quite successful. Um, they put five or six sensors around, a nice little dashboard to show you the state of it all, and I'll give you some examples. They've got one on a gate, so it can tell you if the gate's open or not. They've got one on the slurry pit to tell you if the slurry level is going to reach a certain level. They've got one on the vaccines fridge to tell you if the temperature is dipped below what it's safe to store that as. Um, and they've got a couple on some of the bins to tell you when they need emptying. What they didn't manage to do and what they wanted to do more of was get more of that engagement. So after, after they'd gone in and deployed some of these examples, they were hoping that more people grab this stuff and run with it and do more with it. The, inter the interest was there, but ultimately the students were there to do agriculture. It wasn't on their coursework to do anything with it. So it, it didn't quite grasp what they wanted to do with it. So they came to speak to us, the techies, and asked us, right, well, how can we do more of this? How can we take this further? I said, and, uh, you know, can we do another couple of events, that kind of thing? I said, no, if you want to get real hands-on with this, you need to run it for much longer, much more, and give people time to learn, play with it, and develop it. So that's what the year of IoT is. A bit of a tenuous link to the Marconi connection to sort of set the scene, but ultimately it's about awareness of use cases, awareness of business opportunities, um, skills uh, level sort of improvements, just generally getting people excited about this stuff. That's the purpose of this. There is a video here, which I won't show. I'll get the audio working at the end. And that will take you through sort of some of the things they did last year. Um, to give you an idea of what I mean by successful, they got the um, Welsh Government Minister to come up to actually sort of sign off on its open... We're getting Welsh Government level sort of interest and backing for this kind of stuff. That goes for North Wales Tech as well. We're having lots of conversations with local authorities because they all see the benefits of having an active tech community. We'll come back to that later. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Science Park is involved. So half of our events over the next year are actually in the University Science Park. We're looking to see if we can get the students involved in projects and bring those across as well. So it's literally everybody's invited. You're, you're all invited as well. Do you want to go on? We've got a new Enterprise Hub as well. <coughs> so. The North Wales tech bit of this is a bit like this. We need to get people involved. How, how do you convince people that they should actually get involved and do stuff with this? So what have we done to try and enable that? You know, th this, this is what you're up against. How, how, do, how do you get the horse to drink the water once you've got it there? You've got to make it interesting for starters. You've got to make, make something available that make makes it worth people's while. Pizza? That tends to work. <laughs> um, that does work better than you think, actually. But, you know, th those kinds of things. Th this is another thing we wanted to challenge. You know, um, why why are we doing some of the things the way we're doing them? There's there's real issues with the resources and local authorities. There's real issues with the health of some of these industries that we're looking at, agriculture, tourism, that kind of thing. What can we do about that? And you know, th really sort of accept that this is going to try take a few attempts to get it right. So this is the motivation behind it. We just keep on trying, adapt, 
react, fail fast, and move, you know, move along with it. So to give you some sort of uh, context, up on this hill here, this is um, where the original Marconi transmission from North Wales to New South Wales and Australia was. And um, it happens to be about 12 kilometers, roughly sort of Laura Wan um, stated range. And there's some exceptions to that in the room. And um, you know, th this, this is how rural you're talking. There's a lot of green there. That's what you're up against. Most of this is farming land. The old town, uh, you can't see Bangor there, but this is Carnarvon. Tens of thousands of people in hotspots, towns of size, lots and lots of fields, lots and lots of tourism, lots and lots and lots of agriculture. And this is a certificate um, for that transmission from north to south. I just want to skip through that. Funnily enough, um, we do have some IoT companies in North Wales. Pinnacle, um, based in St Asaph, have been doing and dabbling with IoT stuff for quite some time. They're quite large. They've got lots of equipment deployed in places like airports, uh, local authorities around the UK, and I think uh, further fields as well. Um, and Rob Shepherd, one of our co-conspirators in North Wales Tech, happens to have done some work for them for the last year. So Rob came along and explained some of the kind of things that they've been doing. Everything from, uh, there's one, one example I wanted to pick out. So they were working with Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire Council. They were um, deploying, uh, I think it was Laura Wan across the lighting system in the city, and they were making savings of hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. It literally, I think it was 800,000, something like that, saved by changing the way they manage the lighting. And what Rob was saying about this is, I'll try and get Rob over to do a, a, a talk, actually. I'll come back to that as well. Certain sectors, certain use cases, like this one, the, the lighting, can afford to put the infrastructure in place, make a saving, and justify it on their own right. If that deployment is then on a public network, like uh, the Things Network, everybody else benefits as well. So in Aberdeenshire, they managed to get uh, some of the, the bins, the big hopper bins around the city, wired up as well, so that they could actually, instead of running the bin lorries around, emptying them every day, even if they didn't need it, or every, every week, whatever, they were doing it on, on a as and when needed basis. So those kinds of examples. One particular use case actually funded itself and enabled the others. So we're looking for these kind of interactions where one thing enabled can actually then lead to other things in other sectors. So Rob's running what we've called the core events. So, so this, is, this is the meat of what we're actually doing for this now. And um, these are structured, prepared walkthroughs of different aspects of Internet of Things. So um, we've had a few of these already. I think we've had about f four of them so far. Uh, so three types to begin with. One, looking at the use cases. Why would you be interested in this? You know, what are people using this for in industry? That was the first one. This, oops, that's probably that one actually, folks. So non-technical audience, why are you interested in this at all? <clears throat> Something I wanted to point out about this, the scheduling. We deliberately put one in the day and deliberately put one in the evening. What you tend to find is people in business, authorities, the nine to five, come to one, the people that are interested in sort of more of the hobbyist or it's not their primary industry, come to the other. We've deliberately done these kinds of things to enable every chance possible of getting people involved. <clears throat> the second event, much more technical, hands-on, showing people, running through a, a tutorial of getting a, uh, an Ar Arduino to read from a sensor and send a message out so it's over TTN. So hands-on for that one. Again, these are not focused at the tech community as such. They're more focused at the business, the business side of things or the people that are in you know, tech that haven't got hands-on at home, just to make them aware of, right, th this is how easy it is. This is the kind of stuff involved. So, and then the third one, uh, the first of which is tomorrow, is looking at the other end. So a lot of people are focused on the devices, where you put them, deployments, but ultimately, once they're out there, it's the other end that's useful in some respects. It's where does the message go? What does the data, how is the data used? So tomorrow's event is about looking at the other end of this. What are you going to do with this information once it's out there? You've got thousands of devices around. 
what, what's it for? How are you going to present it? How are you going to interact with it? Um, we're also looking at running sector-specific interactions. So when we, when we wrote up the proposal for this, we wanted to look at different sectors and try and get them excited you know, for their own sake. So the ones we've got are agriculture, tourism, local, um, social care, and local authorities. So the councils, the health service in some respects, uh, the home, home health service, uh, tourism, a big thing in North Wales, and agriculture as well. So a little later on, we'll have a look at some of those use cases. So for the first two months, we're running those core events where sort of hands-on, structured, Rob and Joe are doing a lot of work preparing the materials for that for people that may not have seen the stuff before. <coughs> The other side of the fence is, like Jackie was mentioning this earlier, we're going to run an event where people can come along, ask questions, and tinker with stuff every two weeks for a year. And we've got some kit for people to play with, which I'll describe. We have a gateway installed in the Minai Science Park building in MSpark. We're looking to get some more of those deployed in North Wales, so they have, these devices have somewhere to talk to. This one, um, on top of MSpark, was actually donated to us by Microsoft. Uh, they came along a few, week, a few months back, and they were interested in sort of encouraging what we could do in North Wales. They gave us a gateway, uh, a multi-tech gateway, so it's you know up to the task. <coughs> uh, this is one of the kits that we've got. I've got one of the boards over here. It's a um, Arduino compatible M0. This one's a Feather. Um, just you know, entry level or thereabouts to let people easily get involved in this. Um, Rob did an enormous amount of work digging through all the different hardware, and I've got some information about what he tried and what we went through. And this is one of the kits. The interesting thing about this is the whole thing is based on Grove connectors. So people can come along to one of the sessions, and they can pick a you know a temperature sensor or a light sensor. No soldering, no breadboards. Connect it. Off you go, making it really, really simple for people to try out and learn the basics of this stuff. Um, we've got some samples of other hardware, so that's a bu bucket load of PyCom equipment there. We've, we've got a, 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 a pile of hardware for people to look at, try one before they buy one. Um, and the other one that we've got in, in the kits is one of the things network um, Unos as well. So it's entry level get started, get your stuff out there kind of stuff. This is one of the, one of the examples Rob's working on. It's a, a, it's, a, it's a rain sensor that sort of triggers, you know, there's so much rainfall. He's, he's got lots and lots of use cases. I don't want to steal his thunder. He might be over here to tell you about them. So the clinics are about groups like this, just like you guys, coming together and tinkering with kit. I guess you're already doing that. Hands on though, not sitting listening to people like me, actually putting this stuff together and working together on some of these. Learning from each other is really important as well. Um, we have a lar rather large spreadsheet of suggestions of what we should do in each clinic. So about two and a half hours long. And when we have something to offer, the first half hour is going to be somebody talking about some use case or work talking through a piece of hardware. And it's, you know, if you're interested or you want something done, put it on the spreadsheet and we'll see if we can make it happen. So Rob is keen to do one on uh, antenna design, building your own antenna. Another one might be on uh, building your own gateway out of a Raspberry Pi. That's another one that's on the list. There's a whole pile of them. Have a look at it. Um, this is Rob um, with one of the off-the-shelf devices on top of Snowden, proving that we can get to I Minai mean, Science Park in Anglesey. So that map I showed you earlier. Um, as John well knows, you can get a bit further than that. So we're actually getting to the Isle of Man and um, uh, up to Belfast, sort of Northern Ireland area as well. Um, there is a cunning plan afoot, which I can mention. And John, John can tell you more, uh, more about this probably than I can. Um, to actually build a mesh of connectivity using LoRaWAN across all of the UK. So top of Snowden, top of Ben Nevis, and wherever else we can get. So that's 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 a plan we're working on. I'll talk to John about this later. Ultimately, I think the latest, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to try and re recreate the distance of the original transmission. Is that the yeah, idea? So, what um, um, Mr. Penguin and I have been discussing is how we try and get the recreate that, that link part, yep. which is about 
17,200 kilometers by Canada to Australia, by the way. Um, as lots of single small link paths, connected devices to a gateway on top of each of the mountains, and then as many connected things of any flavor you care about, yeah. or talking to TTN, or if you want to hack your own thing, you right. can hack your own thing. So the idea is all of the mountains, so Scarfell, uh, Snowden, Ben Nevis, obviously that's the highest, um, and then Snaefell, and plus the two Irish high points. Yeah. Um, and then just really as an engagement method to get people interested in TTN and the Laura ones. So, you know, the, this is a perfect example of what the Euro of IoT is supposed to be doing. This started with a random series of tweets and all of a sudden you got this crazy idea. More crazy ideas, please. We'll see what we can do. Um, anyway, I mentioned this at the beginning. So on earth, what am I on about here? Going back to those sectors. So you've got tourism, agriculture, social care, and local authorities. We, these four sectors were chosen largely because when Microsoft came to visit for two days back in March, I think it was, it's been quite high up in Microsoft, it was originally from Anglesey, and he wanted to do more in the area. So he, that kind of presence got a lot of people in the room. And we managed to get a few people to you know, commit to getting interested in this. So it's, we need to ride this, you know, make, make use of this. So <clears throat> let me give you some examples of what came up here. I might take some of these off on the way. Um, Social care. Um, here's a use case for you. Uh, there's a lot of people that retire to North Wales. Um, elderly, this is, this is something that the entire world is having to deal with, increased them, numbers of people in, in certain older age ranges. Looking after them, that's, that's a lot of care that people need. That's a lot of resource on the healthcare systems. It, we know it's going to be a challenge. So. How can IoT help with this? Well, this is one of the scenarios that came up. Say somebody's grandmother over in Anglesey usually boils the kettle at seven o'clock every morning. If she doesn't, it's probably an indication that there's something out the, out the norm. Maybe somebody knocked on the door and gone. But then it, actually for the rest of the morning, there haven't been any spikes in the electricity usage all morning. And we can monitor that. Open Energy Monitor, local company as well, makes devices you can clamp onto the side of, the, uh, uh, of your meter. And you can potentially send notifications out. That could, say, that could be to local healthcare providers, but actually it might just be to their family. You know, if somebody hasn't done something today, send a message, give them a phone call, make sure they're okay. So th this comes under the sort of umbrella of assisted living. How can you enable people to stay at home safely when they may have conditions or circumstances that makes it difficult for them. That's one example. Um, uh, another one that came up, there's a lot of interest in North Wales at the moment uh, around dementia. So lots of issues with people getting disorientated, lots of people getting afraid of anxiety type sorts of scenarios. How can you potentially use these kinds of things there? North Wales is very patchy when it comes to things like mobile phone reception. You can go around the corner and it's miles before you pick it up again, especially in the valleys, you know, tr uh, forestry areas, that kind of thing. How, how can we do something about that? So these are the kinds of things that came out of the, the social care element. Um, the learning, people with learning difficulties, there's lots of different examples in there. Um, tourism industry, uh, national parks in particular, uh, National Trust comes into this as well. They have interesting challenges like, um, this particular path up the mountain is really popular because it's the one everybody's heard of. But this one over here is never used because nobody knows about it. And you end up with a compound effect on the expenditure. This one needs to be maintained because of erosion issues. Hundreds of thousands of people go up the, the mountains in Snowdonia every year. And this, this is a common issue. How do you, can you encourage people to not go over there and go over here instead? Well, they're interested in doing things like putting sensors underneath the pathways to pick up on how many people go past, to pick up on levels of um, you know, gravel cover to see if they need to do in interventions. Because some of these parts are tens of miles up the mountains and people don't go there every day to check if they're okay. Um, issues with gates and walls and things like this, all sorts of issues. So can you encourage people to, do diff to, to change their behaviors? Um, I usually have a slide to put up to go with this. Most of you will, will have heard of Pokemon Go. Yeah, app, app, app 
that you, you know, go around chasing God as well everywhere. Um, well, what if you could use apps like that, which encourage people to go to McDonald's, um, to encourage people to change which paths they use to go up the mountains? Now, there's no mobile phone reception in some of these places. You need to be able to count the number of people that go past. So can you combine these things and put them together? Can you gamify? You know, you, you get a discount in the local store if you go that way, but you don't if you go that way. Um, now, when Microsoft were over, um, Paul Foster from Microsoft, senior engineer there, gave us some examples um, of what they've come across. And there's one that's stuck in my mind where they're actually using um, parking sensors and traffic monitoring sensors to dynamically change the sequencing of traffic lights in cities to encourage people to go away from the hotspots to other areas. So don't go to this car park because it's full, literally changing the, the traffic signals to get them to go other, to other parts to load balance the cities. That's the kind of thinking. You know, can you do this in rural areas? That's the kind of thing that came out of this. So, um, you know, that's the mountains ticked off. Another one, railways. Uh, steam railways, we have quite a few of in North Wales. They have a very interesting issues to do with putting things on fire. <laughs> uh, the train goes down the track, sparks come out, and they start fires every now and again. This is a real problem for the farmers or landowners in the area, and worse than that, there's the issue of whose fault it is. Who actually, did, it, did it actually happen spontaneously because of sunlight, you know, bouncing off a piece of metal and starting a fire, or was it the train that did it? So they were interested in use cases like, can you wire up your mountain railway, the same could apply to you know, more practical railways, um, and start sensing those kinds of things. So they were interested enough to offer to you know, put base stations, Laura One base stations, all the way, because they have spots along the railway for signaling and things like this. Those kinds of use cases, that's one from the railway example. Um, the next two are kind of agriculture, sheep and cows tracking road bikes. <coughs> Massive issues with people stealing agriculture equipment. You know, a tractor will cost you 100,000, 250,000 for the sort of high end ones. And people turn up, load them on the back of a truck, and walk away because quite often they're in quite remote areas. A farmer might have multiple sites. By the time you've figured out what's going on, you can't find them again. So the, the modern tractors tend to have built-in um, GPS and uh, G, um, uh, GSM of, of 3G, 4G type technology in them. But again, they don't always have signal. You know, some of these other long-range radio technologies might be better for this. Quad bikes are actually probably more so than tractors because they're easier to Check in the back of a van and Nick. Sheep and cows came up. Um, sheep rustling is a problem. Quite a big one, expensive one. We didn't know this, well, I didn't know this, um, was as big a factor until um, we, one of the events we had for the year of IoT about two or three weeks ago, room full of predominantly agriculture background people, and I asked them, right, what are the challenges you've got? And they said, people stealing equipment. And I mentioned, oh, what about... Um, dog worrying, or um, dogs attacking sheep had been in the news, that kind of thing. And there'd been a, lot, a huge thread on Twitter about, you know, what could you do about this? Um, all sorts of very appropriate and very inappropriate suggestions as to how you could deal with these issues. Spoke to a bunch of farmers, said, oh, yeah, it's very interesting, but actually sheep rustling is more of an issue. So actually engaging these sectors, speaking to the sectors as opposed to guessing or hypothesizing. The media go for one, the real issue is the other much more impact in terms of the bottom line for the farmers. So they're really interested in actually figuring out what we can do with this. Now, immediate one, sensors on gates. We've already got a pile of farmers that want to put sensors on gates all over North Wales. So come and help. Um, but that's not quite enough because um, there's ways of you know, tampering with those kinds of sensors. It wouldn't take that long once you know it's there to get around it. So the next question is, could you put something on the sheep to track them? That is done. It's quite expensive. You know, you might have a few hundred sheep and you can't be spending 20, 50 quid on each one. So how, how do you deal with those kinds of issues? Then you need to figure out, well, what, what are you going to watch? You, main, you can't put a mobile phone in there, no, no signal. Are you going to GPS enable every sheep? That's not going to work. So some of the suggestions that came up are things like, can you put an accelerometer on a couple of them? Because they tend to 
you know, herd, move around in, in clusters, to figure out, well, are they moving in a particularly unusual way? That's one of the, the things that's come up to explore. Um, this is not that unusual. They're already doing this with cows. There's, there's you know, belts that you can put around their necks. They're already doing elements of this. When we went to visit the farm, I was astounded by how high-tech they were. Um, when they've got a herd of cattle going into a milking shed, they're already doing customized dosing of feed on an individual animal basis. It walks in, it walks around, RFID tag, looks up you know, that particular cow's history and actually targets, based on history, exactly how much of what's to give it. They're already doing this. What they haven't connected in some cases is some of those high-tech scenarios into when they're in the pasture. So how can we do that kind of thing? Uh, what else we got? Um, marinas and boats. I passed some of those on the way here. Um, lots and lots of sailing boats in North Wales. Masses of them. Probably some around here as well. Um, usually in the boat yard, quite often left unattended for months on end. Similar scenario with the static caravans. You see loads of those going across North Wales. What percentage of the time are they occupied? What kind of issues do you have there? Well, you could have issues with damp. You could have issues with people, you know, an um, unauthorized entry, things like this. Well, as, as Rob was pointing out, if you put the right sensor in each one of those, you can pick up on some of these scenarios. You, you, can, you can figure out if somebody's in one of those uh, caravans by monitoring the CO2 level. You can pick up on temperature changes. You know, is the temperature inside mismatched the temperature outside? Somebody actually to turn the heater on, things like this. Um, and th this is where some of these examples of crisscrosses come in. Social landlords, local authorities that rent out council houses, they have the same kind of problems. Um, if you've got a family that's maybe not opening the windows enough when they're drying the clothes or certain patterns that, you know, leading to condensation, you get issues, very expensive, very, very expensive to fix later down the line. Can you intervene early to pick up on these issues? Um, fully enough, if you put a couple of the right humidity sensors in, the right kind of temperature sensors in, the same solution will work for the caravan, the boats, and those social housing scenarios. So th this is what we're looking for, these kind of interactions where one industry on its own might not be able to afford or justify or get enough of momentum to do something. Can we get it by introducing them to each other? And uh, yeah, some success there. What else we got here? Um, oh, the beach one, another example. Uh, random tweet, can we put something in to indicate something about the water quality in a particular bay on Anglesey? That's another one that popped up. Now, these, are, these are the real questions that people are coming up with. So I'll ask it, I'll open it up to the audience now. Have you, how, how many of these have you thought of? How, can you think of any others that you've done that kind of fit into this perhaps unexpected category? I think for, for the um, static caravans and the marina with boats, yeah. you need to talk to Nick Birkinshaw, who spoke uh, about um, Laura Wan and stuff at uh, Ives in Liverpool a few months ago. Okay. Because he's developing <clears throat> basically kind of sensors to work as alarms and things in marinas for boats. And then it's gone, oh, and also we could do stuff in caravans and like, yeah, Excel Robinson's to notice when it, so not static caravans he's looking at, also. Non -static to, 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 to work out when they're you know, suddenly tilting when they shouldn't be because they've been hooked up to something and someone's about to turn them away or something like that as well. But um, yeah, he's. Yeah. And that, that one crosses over to the, um, the agriculture equipment sort of one as well. Right. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Cool. yeah. Another one. Another one. Test off if you see a bird in some boxes. If you've got more than one of them, just tell them around they're being used. So, what, one of the. Um, examples that mentor more on the, co the company that's sort of um, sponsoring a lot of this. Um, they're working on an initiative at the moment where they're trying to save um, or uh, con control populations of water vole, trying to get the numbers up. Um, so they're trying to trap mink. And they've got the traps laid out, and at the moment somebody's going to have to go out, check them, and do deal with the mink. At the moment that's a manual process, somebody has to do it every morning. When you're trapping, I mean, the opinions of what you think of this aside, if you're trapping certain animals like mink, you have to deal with them very quickly because of uh, the animal welfare issues. So you have to go there and knock them out, whatever, very quickly or you get into trouble. So they're already wanting to look at 
um, IoT enabling these traps to make sure somebody can get there fast enough and deal with them only when there's something there. Because at the moment, they're having to go there and check whether or not there's something being trapped or not. So the, um, you know, the, those kind of wildlife scenarios have started to come out as well. Yeah? Yeah. Over, over quite long periods of time. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So that, that's an interesting one. So one of the other sectors that um, has come up is sort of buildings management, more, more kind of maybe well-known use cases, and um, you know the, there's a lot of. Generally, this stuff is fitted into new builds. So a lot of uh, Microsoft were talking about um, a number of uh, office buildings where they've actually put CO2 meters in different meeting rooms, and um, they actually jig around the schedule of meetings so that if somebody's, you know, if you had a big group of people in one meeting room, CO2 levels actually do drop. Uh, sorry, do increase in those rooms if they're, you know, busy all morning. They're actually changing which rooms people are going into. So they don't feel as lethargic. So y those kinds of things are typically put into new builds. That's a really good point, actually, because there's a lot of older buildings, a lot of listed heritage buildings, actually, that probably haven't had any of this applied to them. Um, National Trust would be one of the groups that I've spoken to that are interested in that, for example. So, yes, good one. Any others? Any? In, in your use cases, what kind, of, what kind of use cases are you coming across or people interested in? What well, are there any, any kind of city-specific things or any things that kind of cross over? Possibly the city seems to do with litter. I don't know whether it, like it would be almost like looking at what the paper should look like versus what it does look like with the obscure image. So if it's a mark pixels are obscure from the wrong colour, it should be to notice that they need to send on that litter picker up. Similar to what you're saying with the picking up the dumpsters. Yeah. So rather than just sending some guy down here. So that's kind of like um, highway maintenance of example. Yeah, yeah. That, that crosses over with another example. Um, that quite a few local authorities were very keen on um, gritting. So at the moment, you know, temperature in an area hits a certain threshold, they <coughs> contract out or send their gritters out to grit the roads. And it tends to be a rather blanket approach. So they'll say, this threshold's hit, cover this place, 40,000 pounds worth of salt chuck on the road. They're interested in doing targeted. You know, if, you, if you can literally scatter temperature sensors around the right places, the, the hot spots perhaps, can you do targeted dosing of salt to drastically reduce the amount of money you're having to spend? Same kind of questions come up in agriculture. Um, Microdosing in fields is a big thing. So at the moment, they're still doing sort of blanket, you know, chuck the fertilizer across the whole thing when you know, fields aren't flat and regular. This bit over here will collect more because it's in a dip. This bit will be barer because they're looking at sort of targeted across a field, uh, microdosing from one patch to the next. Um, the example with um, the robotic tractor, um, things like navigating are big, big issues. How, how do you actually manage to navigate some of these areas? Um, you know, positioning is something that you can do with some of these technologies. Not all of them, it gets a bit, issue, a bit, a bit iffy. But not everywhere can get a 4G signal or three, even a GSM signal. You can get GPS, but that's about it. Long range radio is kind of where you're having to look. So those are the kinds of things that are coming up. I don't think what else I've got here. So those are the kind of use cases. That's kind of what we're doing. And for those that are more interested in the technical side, We've only just started this, so this is quite new. Um, we've got a, a forum that we managed to get funded, and we've got an entire section of it to do with um, 
enabling people to communicate and collaborate, come up with ideas and chuck them in here. So the Three Peaks Challenge is, is in there, for example. John's been in there already. Um, and last week, we had our first IoT clinic where um, Rob, hopefully we'll get him over here to, to walk through this, walked us through the, some of the equipment we managed to get hold of here. So there's details here of some of the, the boards that um, Rob considered. He's got lots of experience trying these out. Lots of uh, compromises when you're picking some of the hardware. Um, so for example, uh, some of the boards you can run uh, CircuitPython or MicroPython on, but there's only certain elements of some of the LoRaWAN stack that you can use. There's, there's certain features that are not enabled depending on what you're picking. So Rob's been through a lot of that and he explained sort of how he came to uh, choose the devices he's got. But he's, we've, got, we've got links to all of the things here. And there's trade-offs with them, the cost-based trade-offs or feature-based trade-offs. Um, we've ended up with a combination of boards, uh, these two. Um, the Things Network Uno, which we have in a kit with those Grove connectors and sensors. There's no soldering, no breadboards. That's available. We've got four or five of them for people to come along, just play with. They're there to work with. And the other one is this one, the Adafruit um, Feather M M0. And again, you can, you can plug that to all these sort of kits of Grove connectors and start learning how to use it. So that information's up and you can have a look and see. If, if you, by all means, if you disagree or have better ideas, check them in there as well. I'll show you some of you do. Um, there's some other things I mentioned which we haven't looked at yet. Things like um, uh, the LoRa gateway hats for the Raspberry Pi. One of the events might be to set up your own gateway at home. And I think um, Matt, which some of you know, um, uh, uh, down in South Wales, he just got his hands on one of the micro bit LoRa nodes. So you can, you know, there's people t looking at those kinds of things. So if you're scratching your head, mm, should I buy this? Will it work? There's a community here. Use it and see if, if they've uh, managed to get it to, to do nice things. Rob, Rob had a good point about the micro bit one, actually. For the price of the micro bit and the, the daughter board, you can buy mm, three of them. <coughs> So there's some trade-offs that, you know, it depends what you want to do. So we've got all of that. Um, and then the next phases are to do more of these, to get hands-on and learn. But where it's going to get really fun is when we start bringing some of these use cases, some of these problems, challenges from these different sectors and introducing them to the people that want to play around and try them. Uh, we've managed to get a few people in these sectors to sort of act as model customers. They're going to act as the liaison, trans translate between the tech and the non-tech. They're going to come along and get involved in the, in the sessions. One, one of the guys um, has actually run with it. He's written a sort of project brief for the sheep rustling problem. Uh, he's a former farming background. He used to be involved in the tech sector, so he's actually gone away and written up a sort of draft project brief. Um, we're hoping to do the same thing with those other sectors as well. Uh, so social care, we've got a few companies and so the local authorities interested in that one. Tourism, I haven't really started that one yet. Um, we've got some very big companies, the likes of Zip World, Rib Ride, you know, the big tourist attractions over there. They've got big estates. They've got things halfway up mountains that can break or, um, you know, it's coming across here, you look across to the, the wind farm. Um, you know, you've got to communicate with those things. Asset tracking, lots and lots, lots of use cases that um, come to mind. So that's the background. The forum is open and you can join in. Um, you're welcome to, you know, if there's one of these projects or use cases that you want to tinker with or get involved in, um, or you're working on already and want to sort of find more people, you're more than welcome to. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Encourage discussion. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you very much, Carmen. No and all, all the links in here actually go, you know, to the, the proper um, the pages for the product information. So uh, Rob was really keen to come over today. He couldn't make it. So I don't want to go into too much detail with this. I'd rather let Rob come over here. Yeah, that'd be good if we can actually yeah, twist his arm, persuade him to yeah. check over that. He, cool. he did this last week for us. I mean, uh, I'll show you some photos. Holiday snaps, there you go. 
So um, that's uh, Simon talking about. This, this gives. Um, there's a reason I'm doing this. This is how many people we got at the launch event, and out of shot, we have Adrian as well over there somewhere. Um, John was there as well. Yeah, we were probably about where the photo was taken, weren't we? Yeah. Like hiding just, in the like. There. Tactical <laughs> so you know, th th this is the building that we're in. So it, we, we've been really lucky to get these kind of facilities. Um, <coughs> He's still not in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, very, very well. Yeah, we're good at, at hiding in the um, uh, uh, we, Yeah, the, we were playing this right. shot a minute ago. So th this right. is one of the, um, <laughs> the core events. That's Rob. That room is full of people, predominantly from the agriculture sector. That's in the agricultural college. So that's kind of how many people in the middle of the day you're, you're getting. So you know, a number of those were explaining exactly why my bright idea as to how how to prevent sheep rustling <laughs> wouldn't work. Within you know seconds, they could say that would work, and that's really valuable as a techie because we think we know well, we know don't, don't we know better. We just run ahead blind usually is the way we do it. So that it's very very valuable to get hold of actual people that understand the real world that's the implications of it. That was the second event. All those people are hands-on with the equipment um, in, the, in the digital kit. Um, this is the one I wanted to get to. That is one of the kits. So plug and play, no soldering, off you go. Um, documentation provided to get you off the ground. Um, and this was the last week. This was Rob wa walking through for, I think he talked for about an hour and a half about how he ended up picking the kits, components that he did. Um, many of you might recognize some of the boards in there. Um, so we can, uh, hopefully we can get Rob over and actually do something a bit like that to explain, you know, don't pick this one because, or pick this one. But a, a lot of the discussion was about trade-offs in battery life. Um, that box there, the top, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, set to this, the right sort of frequency of signaling, that will last 10 years. You know, deploy once, 10 years later, the battery is still running. Um, that ha that's an off-the-shelf device. I think it's about um, 50 quid for that one. Temperature sensor, humidity, light sensor. Um, and we, we, we tried that one. We put it in the fridge. In the, that building has a cafe in it. And we put the device in the fridge, mainly because I wanted to find out if you could get a signal out of a stainless steel fridge. Turns out you can. Yeah, we've worked that out as well. <laughs> and um, I explained what I was doing to the chef. I said, ooh, that's really cool. I want one of them. Now, they can not do the manual checking because it's a regulatory thing. But he gives, you know, I, so I, I knew that from speaking to one of the staff. Oh, it probably won't, won't be that useful for them. But actually, he turned around as soon as he saw it. Said, that's really useful for Christmas holidays because they wouldn't normally be checking, but they want to know because they want to be able to intervene. Yeah. Same with weekends. So just because the regulations sort of say you can't do this doesn't mean it's not useful. Um, that, that, that version is sort of a weatherproof one. We've got a few of those outside now. Um, there are some Wi-Fi based sort of 802, 802 .6, sorry, 8266 and ESP32 sort of devices in there. But most of the things we've focused on are long range radio because we have rural kind of deployment scenarios in mind. So we're likely to have a few Wi-Fi targeted sessions as well. But ultimately, it's a case of the equipment's there, the events are booked, come along, get involved. Uh, yeah. Cool. Cool. I'll be around for until I need to run for my train. So. Yeah, I was going to say, any questions <laughs> at all from anyone? Uh, Linux side, mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, we will be having people put, setting up gateways. Sort of setting, I think we're going to do a session on using Raspberry Pis to set up gateways. So that might be interesting. So it's just a, a Laura One hats on a you know, box standard Linux distribution on a on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I have started speaking to Guy at the, the um, uh, Linux Foundation as well. Um, <coughs> For a completely different reason, um, the get together stuff. He's the, the author yeah, yeah. of the get together software, yeah, yeah. but he happens to be the representative um, developer, a community representative for something called EdgeX. So this is a, a Linux Foundation sponsored stack for um, edge computing and these kinds of uh, mobile 
device network. And they also have other non-proprietary long-range radio technologies. That, so that might come into it. I think we're likely to be comparing and contrasting some of the different technologies as well. The kit we've got is all LoRaWAN. But you know, people have asked, well, why should we pick LoRaWAN over Sigfox? Or, um, is it's nobody's fun. using Sigfox? Um. <laughs> I don't know. I find out there's a subscription fee, so no, that's off the list. Um, NBIOT was another one which piggybacks, that's piggybacking off the mobile phone networks, isn't it? Yeah, we had a talk about that last month. A yeah. uh, guy from Vodafone, I can't remember his name now, John Tursley maybe. Was that um, the Vodafone one? Yeah, yeah, yeah he came he spoke at IoT Liverpool a few weeks ago so be, about their NBIOT stuff. Um, the, the, apart from sort of you know, seeing what we're up to. The other thing is an open invite to invitation to come over. Go, on, go, go up the mountains, go on the beaches while they're there, make a weekend of it. Um, but if, if any of the, your speakers, some of them might be in the room, want to come along, that would be more than welcome to come along and sort of uh, get a different perspective or mm. tell us what we're doing wrong. Or so that's the open invite. But yeah, it's, it's not ours, it's um, get involved. We're hopefully going to be starting some set workshops over, not, not specifically for a year of IoT, but we're going to be starting some North Wales Tech meetups in Wrexham as well, which is probably a lot easier for you guys to come across to. Yeah, so easier than Anglesey, which was, that was fine. I, spoke, uh, I, I gave a talk at North Wales Tech in Wrexham uh, a January. few months ago, yeah, in January, January. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not too bad to get to. Not too bad. And the new Halton Curve's just reopened, so... Yeah. There's now direct trains to Wrexham, I think. There is from Lime Street. But there isn't the Bangor. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, unfortunately. Yeah, so the, that might be. The, we're in Anglesey and Gwynedd because of that's where the social enterprise have funding for. Um, but the, the kind of, they've been very good to us. They've paid for all the kits, they've paid for um, uh, some of the more structured events to be set up. All these clinic things are on about. They're kind of volunteer-driven. Come on, everybody's sort of on the same terms. The equipment is there for people to use. Um, but we're all, you know, there's, they're not going to. They're quite happy for us to take some of this further afield. I think the kind of potential interaction between you guys, Rex and us, you know, they're, they're, they're quite keen to see what we can do. Um, do you have any interaction with the university? It's a big university town. I, 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 my day job, this is the hobby, oh, okay. um, my day job is I work for Bangor University. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you've got a lot of interaction. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I work for the IT department and sort of mm -hmm. systems architect doing data centre type stuff. On that basis, I don't know if anybody from the Liverpool universities here um, or the colleges, uh, one of the local colleges is, is actually coming along to the sessions because they're interested in running an IoT course. And when they saw the, um, you know, this Grove connector-based setup, they thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Get get the soldering and stuff out of the way. Just, they're, they're, you know, we've already fed something useful into potentially a course at the local college. Uh, I'm currently speaking to um, uh, JISC about their partnership with the Things Network, um, trying to see, uh, they've been running that for a while, they've got a few universities around the UK looking at intelligence campus projects, might be worth finding out if any of the mm. ones are involved, because um, we'd like to sort of, we, we've got a gateway on the science park, which is about 10 minutes drive away from the university, but line of sight, Bangor is in the dip, so we get no signal whatsoever, so we're looking to get um, a gateway in town, that these, you know, so the students can go backwards and forwards and work with it. Um, but it's not, you know, not limited to rural either. We're anything and everything is in scope. Um, we're going to have a few signature projects that funding are kind of wanting us to look at because they can take it further. Um, really good kind of uh, side effect of the way it's funded. Um, the leader program is all about sharing, so a lot of the ideas and stuff we come up with will be very openly developed. Um, but, I mean, you know, hopefully encouraging people to use sort of commercially permissive licenses perhaps so that people can do something with them later. So it's not just sort of, it's not by no means hobbyist sort of tinkering. We've got the actual local authorities, actual local companies wanting to interact with this. Um, we're also going to starting to find people that yeah, there's a thing off the shelf that will do that already. We don't need to build it, but they wanted deployed last week. 
So we're probably going to need to sort of build a, a, a list of companies in North Wales or the, the catchments out this way, perhaps even, that we can point to, well, if you need to do the boats, you need to speak to mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Because uh, now that we've uh, piqued their interest, they're kind of chomping at the bit to... Excellent. Well, yeah, let's do it, kind of thing. So the gates, the, the, the gates on the, um, in the farms is a good example. But the, I, the tricky one with that is how you make them tamper-proof. Mm. You can easily make a device that will tell you the gate's open. The trick is, given the incentive of the people you know, interacting with it, stealing all the sheep, how, how do you actually make that robust enough? Um, the same sensor can be used for other things, like um, uh, a rambler goes up, opens a gate, doesn't close it. Chances are they're not going to disable the sensor, they're just going to leave the gate open. So there are some use cases that aren't quite as tricky. Um, but the, yeah, we end up with a lot of issues with that, pro with that as well. Um, but yeah, there's... Yeah. Cool. Not own it, but you have that managed by people that are in the community. Not yeah. they just turned up. People that have been doing law have been doing all this for a long, long time. So you know, so you've got the benefits of a public network as yeah. well as a private one. So if somebody does need a service level, then you at least have a, an opportunity to apply that because the duty cycle, having used it myself a couple of times, is open to something and leaving it on. So. There's another project I'm involved in that, um, that that fits in with really well. So um, in Bethesda, where I live, just outside Bangor, North North Wales, just 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 this side of Anglesey, um, we've actually got a hundred homes that have, for about two years now, got smart meters in them with active billing. It's quite a cool project where um, we're formed a cooperative, and there's a, a two, two hydro generators in the project, and the, the arrangement we have is. If the local hydro is running, we get a much discounted re rate on our electricity. Uh, first of its kind in the UK. Okay. Um, the, the first deployment was using GSM modems. But there's a few of us now, I think there's about 10 of us, that have actually got the upgraded communications module in that. And that's LoRa. It's, it's Wi-Fi based through, through, through the household um, broadband. But the backup is LoRa. So we're looking to deploy a more a higher SLA LoRaWAN network to enable that because we want to roll that out. The, the initiative is to roll that out in uh, the UK wide. So you're talking of thousands of homes that will have smart meters in them sending information back. But you know different sectors have different SLAs, so that'd be a good example. Yeah, but that I means that Adrian and I talked about this plat platform co-op. Yeah. So you're you know you get your ability to monetize and get paid. Yeah while simultaneously giving a, a really good quality network so that everyone can develop these use cases and improve yeah. their use cases work and then take that and then they can become that next wave. The, the, sh the shared infrastructure message, um, like the, the, the local, one of the local public authorities had already been tinkering with LoRaWAN for probably about a year or so and they, they were planning to do a private network. But actually having spoken to them, having listened to the other sectors and seeing what benefits they may have from it, they're really starting to open up about the idea now. I'm sure you've seen a lot of this. Yeah, it's good. It's Adrian brought me on to platform code. And it's a yeah. great notion. Yeah. Because it's not as a means to, you know, in two years go, oh, I'm going to charge you. Well, it's funny, it's funny. embedded and baked into everything that, yeah. that you do. So. When, uh, when the guy from Microsoft was over, um, he, he was born in Anglesey, but he's been over in Seattle quite, quite high up for years. Very different way of thinking. So, you know, when he was talking, he, he did a public talk, and um, he was talking about, um, you know, once you've identified these use cases, much like you said, why don't you set up a company to do the deployment? Um, and when Rob was talking about um, what they've been doing with Pinnacle, uh, managing the devices, the asset management, hitting the reset button. <laughs> you know, who's going to do all that? Um, we tinkering like this might you know, crack some use case that hasn't been figured out before. But ultimately, you're going to need somebody to deliver the services. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been really interested in speaking about that because I know that they're, you know, they, one of the ideas was we want to cover all the angles in Laurel. That was one of the ideas that came up. How do we do that? Where the local radio club, 
that have been running for years have the advantage of they know exactly where all the black spots are. Because <laughs> um, they found them all. <laughs> you know, can you bring those things together? Uh, we know, like, Llangevny, one of the towns, uh, it's what, five, ten miles away from M Spark. Forget it. In the depth. Yeah. How do you... The local authorities are looking at things like putting one in every school. Right. That, that, that's come up. <coughs> yeah. I'm happy to do it. Um, they've all got internet connections for the backhaul. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the Highland Railway were kind of interested, which I didn't even think that was a way of getting it. You need yeah. to do that route, yeah. Retracing the beach. You've reminded me now. Where's that picture gone? Here's another incentive to come along and help. Um, where's Rob gone? Excuse me. Uh, that one, right. Um, if you're in as John has been doing. If you're an excuse to go walk up mountains with a sensor <laughs> and, and help map, you know, where, you know, you've got similar issues in, in Liverpool with the buildings, I'm sure. You know, we need to figure out where we can and can't reach. So you just want to walk around and tour, you know, while you're visiting all the castles or the, the upper mountains, put, a, put, a, put one of them in your pocket and see what we get. That's another thing we'd love to do. Well, something we've spun up and that Matt here this chat is going to, um, once we get some time, mm. is our own instance of TTM mapping, so obviously it's open source, so that we can start to add a little bit more logic. JP's works really good. Yeah. That's what got me into, into the, the law of a period. So we've already done a lot of those um, those walks up Carmen Llewellyn and Snow and Noy that we can so There's a lot of use cases, as you said. There's, there's all sorts. Another one is, um, I don't know if it's really an IoT one, but. Um, uh, National Park need to be, need, they actually really need to count goats. Um, they need to control goat, goat, it's part of the terms of looking after the land is they need to make control goat populations. Uh, they can't send people around to find them. Um, you can't fly drones to do it yet, although that's another conversation. Um, can you incentivize uh, ramblers to, to, you know, they take pictures of the pretty goats all the time, but they're not <laughs> recorded. You know, can you hook that up? That's another one. Well, we had, I, did, we did, I did put a game plan and node on a phantom DJI, and uh, just 30 meters in the air, we're hitting Manchester and stock yeah. from, from the world. So now that North Wales is lying up the law, I'm looking forward to making nice. Well, there's, I know there's a few more gateways. There's at least two or three in the pipeline, but that's still you know, a fraction. There's one that you mentioned, the sort of um, uh, T10 mapper. I think it's this picture here. Um, one of the things Rob has done for some of the devices sourced, I think it was AliExpress, some specific hardware for the TTN mapping. Um, it'd be interesting to see if it's along the same lines. So he was thinking of, uh, if there's enough people, enough interest, doing a batch order for the hardware. So if, it's, it's worth the conversation, because it might, it might be, there might be more people that want so to go. So this is, sorry, it's the actual physical mapper app yeah. and the back end as well, so that you can use anything on it. Oh, any device. To start to map. One of the things that we've experienced, as Rob said, it's yeah. more going out and pressing the reset button. Yeah. When you look at the TTM mapper over time, and again, people contribute to those dots. <clears throat> it's an unreliable picture of the coverage that's available. Yeah. So something that's a little bit smarter. So what Matt will be involved with is doing that piece, but the hardware side, we've got a couple of things that we've, we've already been using. Cool. Well, hopefully, I mean, we're, some of the events have been very well attended. I think we might have put a few too many in the series uh, in, in the first month or so. So we're, we're continually reviewing it. I think we're, uh, Friday, we're, gonna, we're having a, a catch up. Because it's a year long, one of the things we're keen to do is actually tweak it as we go. You know, um, so by all means, uh, feedback or check ideas. Cool. And, um, we'll try and get more people over here as well. I think there's a few people coming. I think Rob's coming for Makefest, for example. Um, and uh, we'll have a, a few devices on the table and some pictures of other things we've been up to apart from this. Um, and we'll see. Yeah. Anyway, excellent. Sure. Um, yeah, we should probably just. I mean, yeah, we're welcome. You're welcome to hang around and chat and stuff after the talks as well. Um, but. I figured we should 
Before we draw a closed officially here, um, if anybody wants to play with any of this sort of stuff, then by all means, head over to Wales to one of the clinics or workshops or some other things. But if you want to have a play around a bit closer to home, um, then Make a Night is every Thursday evening. Um, and Make a Day is the second Saturday every month, which is this coming Saturday um, through there. <laughs> um, and we've got, there's a whole load of bits of kit of Arduinos and um, yeah, ESP boards and PyComs and all sorts of bits and pieces. If you want to play around with any of this stuff, then then come along to that. And there's definitely people who can help out with with you kind of dabbling with with that. Um, so I suppose thanks again to Calvin for, for coming over. Yeah.